At this point in our program, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for the evening, Dr. Carla L. Peterson, professor of English at the University of Maryland College Park. Along with membership in the UMCP's English department, Dr. Peterson also holds affiliations with the departments of African American Studies, American Studies, and Women's Studies at the College Park campus. Because of her work across these various disciplines and departments, it is noteworthy that from 1994 to 2001, she served as chair of the campus's multidisciplinary committee on Africa and the Americas. Dr. Peterson was born in Harlem, New York. You know, it's interesting. Uh, in this part of the uh, Mid-Atlantic, uh, everybody has roots in North Carolina, it seems. Right? I mean, I, I'm from the South, deep South, and that's one of the things you learn when you come to this area. And you don't usually meet many people from Harlem, New York, because they also generally come from other places. However, as you will learn, uh, Dr. Peterson's family roots actually go way back in terms of Harlem, New York. She was raised in Beirut, Lebanon, and Geneva, Switzerland, where her father worked in the field of international public health. She's a graduate of Ratcliffe College, where she earned her BA degree, and then subsequently secured her PhD in comparative literature from Yale University. Since earning her doctorate, Dr. Peterson's scholarship has reflected both consistency and change. Whereas her early work focused on an analysis of 19th century French and British novels, her more recent efforts have been centered on 19th century literature, culture, and history as it pertains both to African American women's oratory and writings, as well as the social and cultural history of New York City's black elite. And indeed, it is this latter interest that brings her, brings her before us tonight. For in researching information connected with her most recent book publication, entitled Black Gotham, A Family History of African Americans in 19th Century New York City, she learned much about 19th century black politics, particularly the thoughts and writings of two influential political activists of that period. Alexander Carmel, abolitionist, Episcopal minister, and missionary, and Dr. James McCune Smith, physician and, active, and abolitionist. Both men, it seems, appears to have had a significant influence on our own W.E.B. Du Bois in terms of his thinking on race, culture, education, and black political advancement, as we shall learn shortly. In pursuit of her scholarship on the aforementioned topics, Dr. Peterson has been the recipient of numerous prestigious fellowships, including ones from the Ford Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities. In addition to her teaching and scholarship, she has also worked to bring African-American issues to the attention of non-academic audiences through appearances on TV and radio, through service on museum consulting teams, as well as through affiliations with various speakers bureaus and online newspaper postings. Such outreach has also extended to various international venues. For example, she has served as a lecturer in Japan, an instructor in places such as Brazil, Mexico, and Germany, and as an academic specialist for the United States Information Agency for projects both in Haiti and in Washington, DC. Based on her record of scholarship, teaching, and national and international service, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Peterson is eminently qualified to provide us with significant new insights on the possible origins of some of Du Bois's most important ideas and teaching. So without further delay, I present to you Professor Collar L. Peterson. Thank you very much, Tom, for that lovely, lovely introduction. I hope my talk tonight um, lives up to it. 
So I am actually, um, well, uh, yeah, I'm going to start with a question, which I've never done before in a talk. Um, but I'm going to throw out some names of the <clears throat> most important people I'm going to be talking about tonight and just give a raise of hands um, if you've heard of them. So I'm going to start out really easy. Raise of hands, have you heard of W.E.B. Du Bois? Yay! <laughs> uh, raise your hand if you've heard of Booker T. Washington. Yay! <laughs> Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of Alexander Crummel. Fewer. Okay. Raise your hand if you've heard of James McCune Smith. Even fewer. Um, okay. And then I have a lot of other names in my first paragraph, but I'm not going to be talking about them after that. Towards the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about some writers. So raise your hand if you've heard of Washington Irving. Good. Good. And raise your hand if you've heard of um, Tennyson, Pope Tennyson. Uh, not so good. <laughs> um, OK, so those are basically, especially the first four um, uh, people that I'll be talking about tonight. Um, and I just wanted to say, repeat a little bit of what um, Tom said earlier. Um, the idea for um, this talk, which is kind of brand new, um, so I worked for years and years on this book called Black Gotham, A Family History of African Americans in 19th Century New York City. And it's basically a cultural uh, and social history of black New Yorkers in the 19th century as seen through the lens of my father's family. So my central figures are my great-great-grandfather and uh, his son-in-law, my great-grandfather. And in the course of doing the research, uh, much of what the focus of the book is on education and the way in which these black New Yorkers, my family, but their, um, their friends, their acquaintances, really believe that education was the path to progress and to the future. So I talk a lot about schooling and, and um, education um, and so forth. And I was astounded to discover that my great-great-grandfather, who never amounted to all that much, his name was Peter Guignon, you're not going to find him in the history books, but you'll find him in this book, actually went to school with two of the men that I'm going to be talking about tonight, Alexander Crummel and James McCune Smith. So they were together in school when they were teenagers. And <clears throat> I was fascinated by that fact and did a lot of research, of course, for my book on um, both of these men. But the book is more of a social and cultural history, and I didn't really get to tease out many of the, of the, the intellectual thinking that Alexander Crummel and James McCune Smith were engaged in. And um, you know how when you write a book, it gets longer and longer and longer, and your, your university's press is saying, make it shorter, shorter, and shorter. Um, and so a lot of that got left out of the book. And that's when I decided to do some work on it. And so that's what you're going to be hearing tonight. OK. On March 5, 1897, a group of black men met at Memorial Congregational Church in Washington, D.C. to finalize the organization of the American Negro Academy. The brainchild of eminent Episcopal clergyman Alexander Crummel, the Academy boasted a truly impressive list of founders that included ministers Francis Grimke, Benjamin Tanner, Levi Coppin, J.W.E. Bowen, and Theophilus Gould Stewart. Classics professor William Saunders Scarborough and William Henry Krogman, lawyer T. McCann Stewart, newspaper editor John Cromwell, mathematics professor, professor Kelly Miller, and W.E.B. Du Bois, then instructor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. So just by note, these men were really, really famous in their time. They were the towering intellectuals of their time. Um, and we don't hear about them today, except for Du Bois. Um, in Crummel's words, the academy would bring together men of science, letters, and arts, or those distinguished in other walks of life. Its goals were first to promote the publication of literary and scholarly works, especially those that would help in the vindication of the race from vicious assault, and second, to aid youths of genius in the attainment of the higher culture at home and abroad. Crummel and his colleagues worked tirelessly throughout the day to write, revise, and ratify 
the Academy's constitution. Taking time out to listen to the venerable clergyman deliver a lecture titled, Civilization, the Primal Need of the Negro Race. The evening session was devoted to a paper, The Conservation of Races, by the up-and-coming Du Bois, which has since entered the canon as one of his most imp important early statements on race. Well before 1897, black Americans had acknowledged that Reconstruction had failed and that they had entered a period now referred to as the nadir. The nadir, of course, is the lowest point and the zenith being the highest, so this the lowest point of African American history. White supremacist doctrine proclaiming Negro inferiority and demanding Negro subordination flourished. State after state passed Jim Crow laws relegating blacks to second class citizenship. In 1883, a US Supreme Court decision declaring un declared unconstitutional the Civil Rights Bill of 1875 that had banned discrimination in public places. It was followed in 1896 by Plessy v. Ferguson, which enshrined into law the invidious concept of separate but equal. Throughout these dismal decades, black leaders committed themselves to gaining for the American Negro what Judith Sklar has called social standing. According to Sklar, one of the hallmarks of democracy is the ability of each individual to overcome his or her original status, whether class, race, ethnicity, or gender, to gain the full rights of citizenship. Among these, Sklar listed the right to vote, which leads to inclusion into the polity, the opportunity to work and owns one labor power, uh, which enables independence in the form of property ownership, inheritance, and so forth. Taken together, these rights result in social standing, in the acquisition of social dignity and public respect, without which individuals feel not just powerless and poor, but dishonored. So I think we can all today still think of the way, recognize the ways in which the acquisition of social standing for citizens is really, really important and still very timely. The conservation of races constitutes an early intervention on Du Bois's part in the debate over how best to achieve social standing. His solution lay in the very title. Firmly opposed to those who sought to minimize race distinctions in favor of notions of racial sameness, Du Bois insisted that races do exist and proceeded to define their essential differences. He began by acknowledging physical variations of color, hair, cranial measurements, but argued that these characteristics were so intermingled that they ended up confusing racial categories and rendering racial criteria virtually meaningless. Beyond these grosser physical differences lay, however, other differences, subtle, delicate, elusive though they may be, which have silently but definitely se separated men into groups. These Du Bois defined as spiritual psychical differences constituting what he called the race ideal. So what he was basically saying is the differences, the physical differences of race among races is really not that significant at all. It's really meaningful. And what's really significant are these spiritual psychical differences. And this is what he calls the race ideal. In his musings on the race ideal, Du Bois sought to address not only black Americans, but whites as well. He insisted that much like other races, the Negro possesses a race ideal that finds expression not just in single individuals, but also in the race as a group. Paradoxically, it is the race ideal of black Americans that will ultimately gain them social standing. Hence, Du Bois argued, and here's a quote, it is our duty to conserve our physical powers, our intellectual endowments, our spiritual ideals. As a race, we must strive for we must strive by race organization, by race solidarity, by race unity, to the realization of that broader humanity, which freely recognizes differences in men, but sternly deprecates inequalities in their opportunities of development. Du Bois then itemized the means by which race solidity would eventuate. Through the establishment of Negro colleges, newspapers, business organizations, and what he termed an intellectual clearinghouse, namely the American Negro Academy. 
So what he's saying basically is that there's something special, unique to the black race, and that this, this uniqueness must be fostered through these separate black or Negro organizations. Published as the Academy's occasional paper number two, the conservation of races was a response to the organization's call for the increased production of literary and scholarly works. It affirmed members' conviction in the power of the world word to help, as they put it, in the vindication of the race from, from vicious assault. A canonical text today, it serves both in substance and form as an exemplar of the 19th century's dominant thinking about race, a deep-seated belief in the spiritual gift of the Negro couched in the language of prophecy. So that when we think about the 19th century, um, until I finish my paper, it, the, our thinking is, oh yes, Du Bois, the conservation of races, this idea of racial distinctiveness, right, this race ideal, um, and delivered in this language of prophecy. So if you, actually the, a good context in which to situate Du Bois here and put his thinking would be the first hymn you heard tonight, right? Lift every voice and sing. So put yourself back in that song and you'll really be able to follow um, what Du Bois is saying. Such canonization has obscured several facts. It suggests that the conservation of races was the product of one single person, when in fact it was the re result of a race group effort in which the thinking of other unnamed black intellectuals working across the century infused Du Bois's speech. Today, some of those voices still resonate loud, loudly while others have fallen silent. Most dominant is that of Booker T. Washington. Although invited to attend the March meeting, the Wizard of Tuskegee, as he was called, had declined, aware that the Academy's call for investment in higher culture was an explicit rejection of his emphasis on the Negro's material needs, promotion of industrial education, and willingness to defer civil rights until a later date. In its emphasis on the, special, on the spiritual need, gift of the Negro and the need for Negro colleges in institutions like the academy, the conservation of races constituted a direct challenge to Washington's leadership. Less evident to many scholars today is the imprint of Alexander Crummel. Although frail and elderly, Crummel had been the driving force behind the founding of the academy. He had delivered the first paper of the day, and despite his protestations of declining energy, been elected president of the organization by acclamation. Crummel's intellectual influence over Du Bois was unparalleled and both the substance and form of his ideas about the race's special gifts permeate the conservation of races. Indeed, Du Bois acknowledged his paper as a study in honor of his mentor. Unheard by all except maybe Crummel himself was the voice of his childhood friend, James McCune Smith, who himself had promoted the concept of the Negro special destiny in the 1840s. So, Du Bois is at the Academy is found in 1897. In the paper, I'll gradually be taking you back to the 1840s. Attending to the voices of men like Alexander Crummel and James McCune Smith suggests that 19th century intellectual genealogies are far more complicated than our canon has thus far recognized. To date, Du Bois's quasi mystical theory of race ideals and his increasing antagonism toward the more materialist Booker T. Washington have dom dominated and defined post-Reconstruction history. As a result, our critical obeisance to these two men has obscured Crummel's wide influence, as Du Bois put it, over thinkers at centuries end. Our canonization of Du Bois has further silenced a counter-tradition of, of race deconstruction ideas initiated by Smith in the minor key of irony after he had moved away uh, from the concept of special destiny in the 1850s. Indeed, I would argue that in these later writings, Smith anticipated the thinking of the few unnamed and recognized men who in the heated debate that followed Du Bois's lecture resisted his plea to conserve races, insisting instead that racial mixing was a past, present, and future fact of human existence, and hence that race distinctions are of no consequence whatsoever. 
So what happens at that, at that meeting, at that evening meeting at the American Negro Academy is that Du Bois delivers this address on the need to conserve race, the idea of race, to see the Negro as having special gifts um, and the need to foster those gifts. And everybody is focused on that because that's what's been reprinted and anthologized. But if you go back to the archives and look at the typescript of everything that happened, you see that after um, his speech, a bunch of men get up and one by one say, well, sorry Du Bois, we really disagree with you. Um, we don't believe in racial distinction um, and that they are, as they say, the race distinctions of no consequence whatsoever. So what I'm going to argue at the end of my paper, towards the end of my paper, is that that thinking just didn't happen in 1897, but was really there with James McCune Smith, my hero, um, in the 1850s. Um, so the first part, I'm going to talk about the ideas of the special destiny of the Negro, or what Du Bois called race ideals. And I'll talk first about Alexander Crummel writing in the 1870s and 80s, and then I'm going to trace back to James McCune Smith in the 1840s. So I'm working backwards. Washington and Du Bois were both deeply committed to the same goal of achieving social standing for the American Negro. But their individual life experiences, their place of origin, civil status at birth, and current residence necessarily shaped their thinking. As a result, each man constructed different strategies and different timetables for solving the Negro problem. The Washington Du Bois controversy was not new to the African American intellectual community. Debates over the relative merits of manual labor training and higher education had flourished since, this, since before the Civil War. Quite simply, there were Washingtonians before Washington and Du Boisians before Du Bois. Alexander Crummel had been both. He had already articulated many of the ideas we attribute today to these two younger men at a time when they were just coming into intellectual maturity. In the 1870s, when Washington was still a student and teacher at Hampton, in the 1880s, when Du Bois was still attending Fisk. Crummel's gradual evolution from a proto-Washingtonian orientation to positions more aligned with Du Boisian thinking helps clarify for us the process through which Washington and Du Bois each reached their respective positions on education and shaped Du Bois' thinking about culture. So what I'm going to discuss is the way in which um, Crummel has this idea of the special destiny of the Negro, but first has, comes out with a Washington program, and then only later with a Du Boisian one. Born in 1819 in New York City, Crummel was educated at the African Free School on Mulberry Street in the company of classmates whose thinking would have a profound influence on his intellectual development among them James McCune Smith. After graduation, Crummel studied to become an Episcopal minister and was ordained in 1844. Soon thereafter, he sailed for England, where 40 years before Du Bois, he was able to fulfill his dream of attending a European institution of higher learning, receiving a doctorate of divinity from Queen's College, Cambridge University in 1853. While there, Crummel studied the works of Cambridge philosophers who promoted a platonic idealism, emphasizing the absolute reality of the world of ideas ruled by the central tenet of goodness embodied in man's conscience. Building on these ideas, Crummel formulated his own philo philosophical principles about the primacy of the soul over the body that would later influence the young Du Bois. So we all talk about Du Bois' souls of black folk and think, wow, you know, Du Bois was really onto something when he started talking about souls. And in fact, my argument is that this goes back to Crummel. After graduating from Cambridge, Crummel moved to Liberia, where he labored as a missionary for over the next 20 years. He saw himself as a latter-day Abraham, whom God had commanded to leave Ur so that he could, quote, make of thee a great nation already showing proof of Du Bois' later contention that Crummel contained within him both protest and prophecy, qualities that Du Bois himself would inherit from his mentor. Crummel returned to a changed United States in the early 1870s. 
The Civil War had ended slavery and brought citizenship to all black Americans, as well as the right to vote for black men. Yet mu much work remained. The question Crummel asked himself was whether he could use the power of the word, first to protest the unraveling of emancipation and reconstruction, and second to fulfill God's prophecy of endowing the American Negro with a special destiny that would both grant him social standing and enable him fully to contribute to the process of nation building. In The Conservation of Races, Du Bois grounded his plea to conserve races in the concept of a race ideal. Since scientists had not been able to find, define race according to physical characteristics, the task now fell to the historian and the sociologist. Race, Du Bois wrote, this is a quote, race is a vast family of human beings, generally of common blood and language, always of common history, traditions, and impulses, who are both voluntarily and involuntarily striving for the accomplishment of certain more or less vividly conceived ideals of life. Taken together, Du Bois continued, these commonalities create a specific set of racial characteristics, which has endowed each race with a special destiny. Like other races, God has given the Negro a distinct mission. But up until now, it has only been hinted at through individual heroic figures, such as Toussaint Louverture. Oh, that's another name I didn't ask about. Raise your hand if you know Toussaint. OK, good. <laughs> uh, based, on, based in racial characteristics, the American Negro's destiny <coughs> cannot be a servile Im I imitation of Anglo-Saxon culture, but a stalwart originality which shall unswervingly follow Negro ideals. That's a quote. It can never be fulfilled through absorption by the, by, by the white Americans. Indeed, it is the Negro's race ideal that will transform the nation's culture. Quote, we are the first fruits of this new nation, the harbinger of that black tomorrow, which is, which is yet to soften the whiteness of the Teutonic today. Neither the substance nor the language of special destiny originated with Du Bois, however, but were appropriations from Alexander Crummel, who had meditated deeply on the subject from the 1870s on, beginning with the undated and unpublished The Negro as a Conservative Source of Power, and the 1877 The Destined Superiority of the Negro, the very title of which underscored his preoccupations. In the language of prophecy, Crummel asserted that God had singled out African descended people for greatness, so Crummel really imagined himself as a, almost as a prophet, as an Old Testament prophet. And so his language of this period and even later is, well, think of Jeremiah, think of Isaiah, Ezekiel. It's got that kind of tone to it. Although the Negro's message has not yet been fully delivered to the world, it has been glimpsed in the actions of heroic individuals, among them Toussaint Louverture. So before Du Bois, um, Crummel is invoking this, um, the hero of the Haitian Revolution. Crummel now called on black Americans to, quote, march on the path of progress to that superiority and eminence, which is our rightful heritage and which is evidently the promise of God. In these early years of his return, Crummel paradoxically worked out his concept of special destiny in terms that anticipate not the later Du Bois, but the later Washington. In so doing, he sought simultaneously to calm white fears of Negro domination and to placate black Americans' growing anger at racial injustice. In the Negro as a source of conservative power, Crummel placed proto-Washingtonian ideas within a religious providential framework to assert that the American Negro was above all characterized by his willing submission to authority. The trait he insisted this trait, he insisted, was the result of a disastrous providence in which first the discipline of slavery and later religious training in freedom had endowed black Americans with a proper moral character, sobriety, order, and self-restraint to enact the true principles of freedom and citizenship and in his words, correct the nation. So there's something a little bit strange we could almost say going on here. Crummel is asserting the, that um, God has singled out the American Negro 
for a special destiny, but then, and that, that, that the Negro does have a race ideal, but then he characterizes this race ideal as one of submission, the Negro's willingness to, absit, uh, uh, to submit to authority, um, which is a little bit strange. Um, in the same, pr and, and this is the reason why, I think, because in the same pr prophetic track, Crummel made yet another proto-Washingtonian argument invoking nativist claims to impugn the loyalty of foreign-born immigrants and assure his white audiences of his people's uh, patience and continued f to f fidelity as native-born Americans whom he d b deemed better suited for citizenship. Much like Washington in his later, later Atlanta Compromise speech, Crummel depicted black Americans as an antidote to the widespread evil of misrule that foreigners had introduced into the nation, rejecting political agitation and insurrection in favor of moderation and accommodation. Like Du Bois, Crummel inserted the concept of conservation into his title, suggesting, however, that what was necessary was the conservation of the nation. So if you know anything about American history in this period, this is a period of intense labor trouble, influx of immigrants, um, people with ideas about labor and getting you know, a fair wage, the beginning of, of unions, um, anarchist movements even, all brought in, uh, many of them, you know, of, of these people of um, European um, heritage having come over as immigrants. So what Crummel is saying is we Negro, we American Negroes are quite willing, uh, we're, we're good citizens because we'll submit, we'll be submissive and submit to authority and we're not going to be like those, those foreign born people who are stirring up all this trouble, this labor trouble, all this unrest and coming with their anarchic ideas. Um, so, you know, trying to make it on the backs of others by putting others down. Well before Washington, Crummel understood that submission meant accepting a subordinate place in the nation's socioeconomic uh, order, a willingness to confine ambition to industrial education and manual labor. So what he does along with saying, okay, American Negroes are basically submissive in nature, he's saying, and we're willing to submit to the extent that we're not gonna look for higher education, but we're going to be in, uh, content with manual labor training, which is a, a, a proto a, a Washington position before, um, before Washington. So he says in one address, um, the great eminent universal need of the black race in this country is training in skilled labor, in mechanical knowledge and handicraft. What we ask the government is to found scholarships for this object. So he's saying, asking the government um, to help establish agricultural schools and trade schools, and there would then be a pool of black labor that would meet, uh, both meet the material needs of the race and contribute to the rebuilding of the nation without threatening this current social order. And so in the process, while he's making this argument, Crummel also says, and again, this is uh, a, a, a proto-Washingtonian idea, we don't need colleges and universities. We are utterly opposed, he pro proclaimed, to the use of colleges and universities when colored men throughout the nation by their industry and activity secure wealth, then let them indulge in the luxury of classical learning. But just now, that is not the great, the absolute need of the black race in general in this land. Pretty out there statement. Crumble went so far um, to create a mocking portrait of a black youth sitting in a white man's kitchen reading Tacitus and Euripides while rejecting the pra practical training in the necessities of life. This image would, of course, later find resonance, resonance in Washington's derisive portrait in Up From Slavery of a young man sitting in a filthy one-room cabin studying a grammar book. The mid-1880s brought about a radical reorientation in Crumble's thinking, away from his proto-Washingtonian positions and towards a renewed vision of the special destiny of the Negro that Du Bois would later espouse. As early as 1886, Crummel was elucidating a more nuanced view of education, promoting the idea of education according to ability. By the time he began organizing the American Negro Academy, he was deriding calls for industrial education as cautious, 
restrictive, limiting in nature. History, he asserted, taught two facts. One, that blacks needed no training in manual labor since they have been engaged in such work for the past 200 years. And two, that the civilizing process in fact precedes the industrial for the very reason that industrialism grows out of intellectual knowledge and not the other way around. Although Crummel never made explicit the reasons for his shift, it was evident that the promises of reconstruction had not been met and that black Americans had indeed entered a nadir. So uh, what I see is Crummel trying, trying, and trying to find a way, an ideology, a way of thinking to make the American Negroes, black Americans, acceptable, and nothing he's doing is really working. And so he comes to reject uh, these kind of Washingtonian ideas of submission and uh, uh, no classical learning, just manual labor training, and he really then um, shifts towards what we think of now of du as Du Boisian ideas. Crummel now stressed the, the spiritual over the material. Emancipation, he maintained, was a change of state or condition, valuable and important, but affecting mainly the outer condition of this people. By outward condition, but outward condition does not necessarily touch the springs of life. That requires other, nobler, more spiritual agencies. In an argument that Du Bois would later adopt, Crummel, Crummel insisted first that only a classical education could help develop these spiritual agencies, and second that once developed, the American Negro would at long last be able to fulfill his special destiny. Although Crummel never used the Du Boisian ta term talented 10th, he argued that higher culture must first be achieved by a class of trained and superior, of trained and superior men and women who would be the molders of its thought and determiners of its destiny. That destiny was greatness, which white, white America had so far denied. To achieve greatness, black Americans needed to begin by shaking off the yoke of white philanthropy under which men like Booker T. Washington still labored, declare their independence, and nurture their own colleges and in institutions like the American Negro Academy. The consequent development of an educated class would rebut racist claims of ne Negro intellectual inferiority and prove blacks' equality to whites. Finally, in proto-Du Boisian language, Crummel claimed that classical education would transform and stimulate the souls of the race and allow its members to attend at long last to their soul life. So now I'm going to shift over to James McCune Smith. And <clears throat> Smith begins out by um, promoting um, also the idea, the concept of the special de uh, destiny of the Negro. Well before Du Bois and even before Cr Crummel, James McCune Smith had articulated the concept of the Negro's special destiny in the early 1840s in his lectures on the Haitian Revolution and his essay, The Destiny of Our People. Born in New York City in 1813, Smith attended the same African free school as Crummel, where he stood out even then for his intellectual prowess. Before both Crummel and Du Bois, Smith sailed for Europe to, to acquire a higher education. He attended the University of Glasgow Medical School, graduated at the top of his class, and then returned to New York in the late 1830s to set up practice as a doctor. A genuine Renaissance man, Smith was also a political activist and journalist. He died early in 1865 while Crummel was still in Liberia. So in, the lect in lectures on the Haitian Revolution and the destiny of our people, uh, uh, Smith is working within Du Bois's tradition of protest and prophecy. And what he does is to cast, once again, or before even Du Bois and Crummel, is to cast African descended people as one of God's chosen races. He interpreted the oppression and resistance they endured in terms of a providential history in which God assured them they would be agents of their own self-emancipation and fulfill their destiny, not so much through violence as through their moral and intellectual uh, capabilities. Before Crummel and Du Bois, Smith argued his case by turning to the historical example of Haiti. So we see that all three of these um, intellectuals 
return to Haiti and to Toussaint Louverture at some point in order to make their case about the special destiny um, of the Negro. It might seem paradoxical that he chose the Haitian Revolution, whose bloodiness had been widely reported throughout the world as an example of blacks' use of reason to gain their rights. But by means of careful historical investigation, Smith countered conventional interpretations by arguing that on every occasion, black violence had been a legitimate defense against um, uh, uh, legitimate defense, defensive response to assaults by whites. Be it remembered, he insisted, that this insurrection was the legitimate fruit of slavery, against which it was a spontaneous rebellion. It was the consequence of withholding from men their liberty. In a final reversal of conventional thinking, Smith argued that Toussaint Louverture's leadership of the rebellion indisput indisputably proved that he was the true Democrat. It was this educated former slave who through constitutional means had endeavored to grant the rights of liberty, equality, and fraternity to all. In the destiny of our people, so this 1840 um, uh, address, uh, Smith turned to consider the special mission of black Americans. Unlike the ancient Jews who never thought of Egypt as home, he argued that black Americans were attached through their blood and their tears to the place of their birth. Like Toussaint in Haiti, in this country, it was black Americans, not whites, who could best uphold the democratic ideals upon which upon which the Republic was founded. Well before Du Bois and Crummel, Smith prophesied that the destiny of his people was to convert, convert the form of the current, gov uh, current American government into substance, to purify it by replacing slavery and oppression with liberty. They would accomplish this goal by following the guidelines set by Christ, relying on right rather than might and good rather than evil. And Smith insisted, quote, the effort must be purely intellectual. In order to maintain the struggle, we must qualify ourselves to reason down the prejudices which bar us from rights. So now I'm going to turn in the last part of the paper to that counter tradition. So what I've kind of explained so far is the way in which the dominant tradition of race, race ideals, um, the special destiny of the Negro, we start with Du Bois, everybody thinks he invented this in the conservation of races, and my argument is no, you can trace it back to Alexander Crummel and then back to James McCune Smith. But then I'm saying there's also a counter tradition um, which rejects the idea of race ideals, that there's something special about um, uh, the, ne the American Negro, and to say that, to deconstruct race and say, well, no, race isn't really, doesn't really exist, um, we, uh, you know, uh, and certainly not in that way. And so this deconstruction of race. So here I'm going to trace it back from the people who challenge um, Du Bois at the end of his talk, the conservation of races, and then take it back from Crummel to, um, uh, to James McCune Smith. Let's return to the moment of Du Bois' lectures. Lecture. Few scholars have paid attention to the lively debate that ensued, in which several Academy members took issue with Du Bois's propositions on race. Two members focused their remarks on the present United States, the first arguing that he could not see how we can live in this country collected as we are and maintain the identity of the race, and the second similarly claiming that race distinctions were being erased right here on the American continent, where we have a conglomeration of the races of the world, of uh, the races of the world. A third member took a broader view, attacking the concept of race from an historical perspective. Quote, there is one mistake being discussed this evening in discussing this question of race identity. Some brethren have talked upon the theory of race, uh, uh, of some brethren have talked upon the theory of an unmixed race as if there were any such thing on earth as an unmixed race. If you will read your Bibles, you will find that in the case of the Jews, there were certain inflowings of blood during their travelings. It is just the same with all other races. There is to be amalgamation. Why? There has always been amalgamation. These ideas did not originate that night with Du Bois's challengers. 
Knowingly or not, they were tapping into an intellectual genealogy of race deconstruction that, amazingly enough, went back through Alexander Crummel to James McCune Smith. So in the destined, the destined superiority of the Negro, Negro Cromwell, as I've explained, has talked about the special destiny of the Negro, et cetera. But after he makes that point, he veers off into a totally new direction, which is a pian to cultural imitation culminating in an ironically tinged meditation on cosmopolitanism as a standpoint from which to dismantle white supremacist ideology. Um, so what he's basically doing here, and this is maybe a little bit um, tricky, but I do want to read the language to you. What his argument is, uh, it's an argument about imitation. And he starts off by saying uh, that white supremacists have been laughing and mocking the Negro as being unintelligent, um, intellectually inferior. But to the extent uh, that the Negro does anything, it's only by imitating. And so what Crummel says here is that, in fact, everybody imitates, and that societies, cultures, civilizations are based on imitation. The traducers, and so this is the quote, the traducers of the Negro forget that the entire Grecian civilization is stratified with, stratified with the elements of imitation, and that Roman culture is but a, foreign, is but a copy of a foreign and alien civilization. These great nations lay the whole world under contribution to gain superiority. They seized upon the, all the spoils of time. They became cosmopolitan thieves. And I really love that phrase, cosmopolitan thieves. In the Negro character resides, though crudely, precisely the same eclectic quality which characterizes these two great classic nations. And thus he is found in the very best company. Give him time and opportunity, and in all imitative art, he will, he will rival them both. Crummel never returned to this argument in any of his later writings, but brief as it is, its implications are startling. In validating imitation as a universal and necessary tool in the progress of civilizations, Crummel had evidently not yet fully committed himself to race ideals. His notion of cultural borrowings reached be back beyond the Greeks, whose civilization was already, as he said, stratified, stratified with the elements of uh, imitation. Um, and, and so this, this notion of cultural bo borrowing suggests the impossibility of cultural purity. It flatly contradicted Du Bois's later definition of race as a vast family of human beings, generally of common blood and language, always of common history, and, uh, history, traditions, and impulses. And it further dismantled Du Bois's contention that the, Negro, that the Negro's destiny is not a servile imitation of Anglo-Saxon culture, but a stalwart originality which shall unswervingly follow Negro ideals. Imitation, Crummel insisted, need, need not be servile, but may be a source of, of emulation, rivalry, superiority. So the idea that we imitate is because we can't think of anything better to do. Um, he just throws that out and says, well, you imitate in order to, to do as well as that person, and then even maybe to do better. And that's what he says um, civilizations um, have been doing. So in one single paragraph, Crummel offers a sweeping alternative history of the progress of civilizations based on a genealogy of culturally impure imitative societies into which the Negro may readily insert himself. The result is a cosmopolitan perspective in which race ideals play little part. Crummel himself knew something about Im uh, imitation. I want to suggest that he borrowed his ideas from a literary exchange carried out in Frederick Douglass's paper in the mid-1850s between two of his old friends writing under the pen names of Ethiope and Communipal. Ethiope was Brooklyn school teacher William J. Wilson, and Communipal was none other than James McCune Smith. Despite the ironic tone of their writings, these two men were engaged in a serious discussion about race. To that end, they chose their pen names with care, allowing each to suggest his particular perspective on race. Wilson initiated the debate. Trumpeting proto-Du Boisian notions of race ideals, he named himself Ethiope 
in order to emphasize his racial identification with Africa and listed specific racial traits based, as in the later Crummel, on ideas of suffering and submission that he be believed endowed black Americans with a special destiny. In his columns, however, Communipaw challenged Ethiop's racial ideals. He rejected both the form and substance that had characterized the destiny of our people to formulate a theory of race de deconstruction in the minor key of irony. Like, like Crummel, Smith's thinking had evolved. Before Crummel, Smith had devised the concept of cosmopolitan theft as a tool with which to challenge white supremacist ideology. So here I'm seeing a real change from um, James McCune Smith in the 40s when he's talking about race ideals and the um, special destiny of the Negro to the 1850s where, as I'm going to show it, um, uh, uh, in a, uh, now, he's really kind of deconstructing the idea of race and saying, you know, out with, out with race ideals. So it, he does this by imitation, by borrowing, by, by in perfect harmony with Native Americans, Africans, and Dutch Negroes. By naming himself Communipaw, Smith suggested that he was the living embodiment of this colonial settlement, and hence living proof of the always already of cultural and racial hybridity in the United States. In playful language that belied the seriousness, his seriousness of purpose, he pointed to his own mixed identity. And here's a quote, and you'll see how different it is from that language of, of that, that kind of high-flown language of prophecy. So he describes himself as a plain Dutch Negro. So you all know that New York was originally Dutch before it was English. And so many New Yorkers claimed, um, until today, right, Dutch antecedents. So he calls himself a plain Dutch Negro with only one head without horns or tails, a lineal descendant from one of the folly fellows whom Washington Irving alludes to in his sketchbook as shining and laughing on our side of Buttermilk Channel. And so that's a part of the, um, of the Hudson River. Again, this is all very New York-y. Um, from this perspective, Smith argued, racial purity is nothing more than a myth. Racial identities are, are like his are impossible to parse. And single races don't exist at all, um, don't exist. All existing racial categories are, are false. Jews, Chinese, and black, blacks alike are all racial admixtures. Addressing Ethiop directly in a cultural borrowing from Shakespeare, Communipaw asserted the historical inevitability of racial mixing. Black spirits and white mingle, 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 and however dear to you may be your ebon hue, that Ethiop is very dark skin, your great-grandchildren will be many a whitey brown. So I'm just going to summarize um, the, his last comment. So in another column, James McCune Smith uh, uh, borrows from Tennyson, and he constructs this pretty ridiculous argument. So how many of you know the Charge of the Light Brigade? Raise your hand. Oh, good, good. Oh, so maybe I should read it. Um, so he starts out with Charge of the Light Brigade, and he says, half a league, half a league, half a league onward, right? That's the beginning of the Charge of the Light Brigade. And then he says, well, Tennyson didn't make this up at all. He got this from a Congo chant, which I found in this magazine. And the Congo chant is Kanga Bafute, Kanga Munidile, Kanga Dokila, Kanga Lee. Okay? And so he says that's the original version of Tennyson's cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them. And then he continues and he says, well, he makes up a line himself. So when um, uh, uh, it's uh, cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered. And then he gives it his own, he, he makes it into his own verse by calling upon some abolitionists uh, with whom he's in disagreement. Wilson to the right of them, Chapman to the left of them, Johnson in front of them volleyed and thundered. What was Smith up to? His comments antedate Crummel's later argument about cultural imitation, suggesting that high culture is not pure, but the result of borrowings from different cultures. But they also extend his old friend's contention in their bold assertion that Europeans borrowed from Africans. Whoever the borrower or lender might be, the result is a form of mingling in which elements from different cultures become so intertwined 
they can hardly be separated, separated out. All of this is delivered in a playful, ironic tone, as if Communipol was saying to his readers, please don't take my interpretation of the charge of the light brigade too seriously. Maybe it's correct, maybe not. But the one, list reason, the one lesson readers should take away is that they must never make assumptions about cultural and racial origins and purity. Okay, so just a final paragraph to sum up. And so this section, the conclusion is called Back to the Future. How did Alexander Crummel and James McCune Smith get excluded from our 19th century intellectual genealogy? I suspect it was a convergence of factors. Du Bois and Washington survived not merely because they were literary figures, but also because they were prominent historical actors on the stage of post-Reconstruction national politics. In contrast, Crummel moved primarily in theological circles, while Smith died well before his time in 1865. Furthermore, Du Bois and Washington wrote in the still highly valued uh, for, in the still highly valued forms of the book and the essay easily put on the library shelves. In contrast, much of Crummel's and Smith's writings have come down to us in the form of newspaper articles or, or speeches and sermons, sometimes printed, sometimes still in manuscript form. Locating them often necessitates trips to the archives to print out microfilm or copy manuscript material by hand. This problem of archival retrieval has resulted in our undervaluing of much 19th century writing. The works of James McCune Smith have by and large been ignored. While Crummel has received greater recognition, he is invoked primarily in relation to, boys, to Du Bois and not as an intellectual in his own right. So what would happen if we restored these two figures to the 19th century canon? First, it would allow us to recognize their signal contribution to African-American intellectual traditions. Second, it would underscore the degree to which intellectual positions are never static but dynamic and demand that we consider the extent to which African-American African -American intellectuals' thought processes evolved as social and political circumstances obliged them time and again to revise their arguments, what we were talking about earlier. Third, we debunked the great man theory in which Du Bois invented the ideas and souls on his own and forced us to acknowledge that these were in fact the result of a, great, of a race group effort. In Crummel's case specifically, it would requir require us to rethink the Washington Du Bois debate by triangulating it through Crummel's thinking. And with James McCune Smith's rejection of the concepts of unified identity and racial authenticity, and with his proto-postmodernist conception of race as racial formation, whose meanings are open to interpretation, we might want to think of African-American postmodernism as beginning in the 1850s. It's time to begin on untangling the skeins of African-American intellectual genealogy. Thank you. Questions? If you have some questions, please ask. Yes. <laughs> Right, right. In Liberia, right. Yes. <laughs> 
Okay. Right, right, right. I don't know too much about their relationship, but I do know that they knew each other and that they took a very active dislike to one another, but I'm not quite sure of the basis of that. Um, Alexander Crummel was a very difficult person. And um, you know, I present his ideas as if he's this great intellectual and just this disembodied mind. But when you get to the body and the man himself, he was very difficult. So he was very arrogant, he was very full of himself, and he went to Africa um, almost with the, the mentality of a colonizer. And this was very typical among African Americans, black Americans, going to Liberia or, or Sierra Leone. They actually went with this superiority complex. So, you know, all African descended people are equal except for black Americans, black US Americans, who are better than anybody else. So he kind of went with this idea of, um, and kind of looking down at Liberians, at native Liberians, and kind of like, you know, I need to teach them everything. He would go on and on about how they were primitive and degraded and so forth and so on. Um, so he didn't, he had trouble with native Liberians. He went under the aegis of a white um, missionary society and uh, uh, there was a bishop there and he immediately, you know, started quarreling with, with him. And so he was on the outs with the missionary society and with the religious orders that were there. He started a college, Liberia College, or maybe if he didn't start it, he was a teacher there. And eventually he fell out with them. He started a coffee plantation, I think, for himself that he wanted to make coffee and so forth, and that didn't work out too well. So it's really interesting. There were, there, I had a lot of other quotes about how he went to Liberia, the attitude with which he went. Um, you know, um, he was a Moses figure. He was an Abraham figure. He really saw himself as, as you know, straight from the Old Testament, and he was going to create a great nation out of Liberia, and it just didn't work out. In everything he tried, it didn't work out. So, um, you know, he stays through the Civil War there, and then, you know, 1865 to 70 is the passage of the amendments, the 13th Amendment, uh, abolishing slavery, the 14th um, citizenship, and the 15th giving black men the right to vote. So I think maybe he thought it this, you know, that this was a good time to come back and to become the Moses or the Abraham in the United States. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Interesting question. Um, I think you can trace him back to Alexander Crummel because um, Cornell West is, I don't know whether he has religious training, but he definitely sees himself almost as a secular preacher. And so if you've heard him talk or whatever, um, he really has a preaching style and he has that, that sense of, um, of mission and purpose, which I think you can very much attach to somebody like Crummel. I would not take him back to James McCune Smith because I think when all is said and done, the really um, overriding uh, sense we get, what we're left with with Smith is his irony and this just total ironic view of the world that leads to this idea of ra race dis deconstruction and he can call himself you know, a Dutch Negro with horns and tails, so like a devil figure. So that, and, and I think that that is, James McHugh Smith's great contribution to the 19th century and why it's too bad he's so um, ignored because we think of the 19th century either in terms of sentimentality, you know, all this gushing and weeping over, you know, the beating of slaves and so forth, or in terms of prophecy, but we don't think very much about irony and I think that that was his contribution, his real contribution. 
Um, but to come back to Cornell West, I think you could probably take him back to David Walker um, and David Walker's appeal. So for those of you who don't know, David Walker wrote this appeal to the citizens of the world, the colored citizens of the world, and especially those in the United States, something like that. Um, and it was, it's a, it's, um, it starts with a preamble and then has four articles. So you know what he's riffing off of, you know what he's imitating, which is the Constitution. But in it, um, there is, it, people talk about that as the form of the Jeremiah, so coming from the prophet Jeremiah, um, this idea of, um, of, a, of a lament um, uh, against your oppressors, but also against your own people for allowing you being, for, for allowing themselves to be oppressed and a kind of a call to arms. So I could really trace Cornell West back to David Walker. I think maybe of them all, he's the most, he's the most Walker, Walkerian. <laughs> the mo he's the Walkerite, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, rather than anything else, yeah. Yes. I want to thank you for the uh, intellectual genealogy. I have a question about the political project that emanates from conservation of the race. So can we really talk about how Du Bois and his followers used that to sort of organize the next Niagara movement and eventually help yes. Yes. So if we were to uh, reinvent this moment where people are arguing with Du Bois, do you think the political project would have been the same? You mean if 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 the people who are arguing with them with him what what their polit had they triumphed what their political project would have been? Yeah. Really interesting. Um, what it's hard to tell because a lot of them are unnamed, right? Um, and we don't know who they are. I don't know what you know. Um, it's just like uh, so and so gets up and the name isn't there. Um, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, if they did not, if you want to follow it through ideologically, right, to its logical con conclusion, they would not be in, f in, f in favor of race organizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are you a political scientist? Absolutely. You are. So take it away, man. Uh, where would you go from there? So yeah, so they would not have been in favor of race organizations, so. Right. Right. Right, right, that's really interesting. So what would they, I mean, I don't, uh, you know, what, what would be the possible, so the question is what would be the possible non-racial, right, organizations, institutions? Um, and yeah, yeah, it's hard to think. So they would have had to go out and maybe organize labor along class lines. Um, No, no, this is really interesting. I'm a literary critic, so I, I'm loving this. <laughs> right. 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 Right, right, right. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I'm thinking of is another way is that in the 1840s, and uh, once again, when black men are forming their conventions, right, 
um, the colored conventions and they're getting together and when they're trying to get, this is within New York State, when they're trying to get back the vote that was denied them after the 1821 constitutional amendment. I mean, the poll tax was so high that they couldn't vote anymore. And, and um, uh, James McCune Smith comes out and makes the statement that he's against. He doesn't want to see this as a race issue, but he wants to see it as a constitutional issue. So that denies not black men, but all citizens who can't. So James McCune Smith has that early thinking. And then in the 1850s, McCune Smith um, joins the Radical Abolition Party where they put up Garrett Smith, white abolitionist as president, and James McCune Smith runs as vice president. Well, you know how far they got, <laughs> which was nowhere. But it's interesting to think about, yeah, if you don't, if you don't what are the alternatives to race-based organizations? And the Radical Abolition Party was what, one year, two years, something like that. Yeah, okay. Yes? How, W.E.B. Du Bois's? You want to answer that? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. Right, so right. But I think that this is a tension that's still very much with us today and that we battle with all the time. Because on the one hand, we're like, sure, race doesn't mean anything. The biologists have proved that there's greater variation um, uh, within a race than across races. You know, there, there's a lot of biology that suggests that race, as, as we understand it today, you know, um, doesn't hold up. Um, and so we can deconstruct race all we want, and yet we still, it seems to me, hold to a version of race ideal. I'm not saying special destiny, that God has destined us for X, Y, and Z. Um, but, but that we still hold to an idea of race where, it, according to Du Bois, you know, we have a common history, a common, uh, what else, is common traditions, common culture, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, I mean, we also, we also live that out, right? So I think that there, we live with that ongoing, that ongoing tension. Um, you know, James McCune Smith didn't resolve it, Alexander Crummel didn't resolve it, Du Bois didn't resolve it at all, and I'm not sure that we can. And so I think this is a way in which you have maybe biology on the one hand, but then you have history on the other. And we've had centuries of history, you know, no, being known as African descended people. And that's, that's also a fact, right? So I, it's a really good question, and I think, it's, I think that the only thing I can say that it's a tension that's still with us, that we, that we live out over and over and over again. Yes, yeah. That was at the Harlem Book Fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, Lincoln Memorial Congregational Church. Okay, so it's what on 11th Street, I think. <laughs> 
someplace between 11 and, no, it's not on 14th. I think it's 11th Street. Yeah, yeah. I went by to see it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, well, if this is where it happened, I've, I've got to go see it. Yeah, yeah. And then if you want more on, uh, uh, on, du Bo on the American Negro Academy, you can go to the um, Union Theological, no, it's not Union, the Theological Seminary in, uh, uh, in Northern Virginia, and they have an archive, and that, uh, I didn't, uh, it's in my bag there. That's actually where I got the entire um, uh, transcript, not only of Du Bois's Conservation of Races, but the discussion after. And that's right outside of Washington, D.C., the theolo Virginia Theological Seminary is what it is, yeah. And they have a little African-American collection, um, and they're very good at helping you, yeah. And they also have papers on Blyden in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.